to hack across America, and we're about to hack across the extraterrestrial highway. Check it out. This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen, and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. And I am so excited because Hack Across America, a couple weeks in now, I'm having the best time. I want to thank everybody that signed up at HackAcrossAmerica.com to participate. Everybody that's come out to the meetups. We had so much fun in Eugene, Oregon, and Portland. And we're doing some awesome stuff here in Seattle on the 15th. Uh, we're going to be in Memphis, I shouldn't forget, on the 11th. So Memphis, Oregon, what's up? Uh, but Seattle's going to be huge as well. We're going to have like, you know, we're going to arcades and we're going to museums and we're going to hacker spaces. We're doing something similar too in Los Angeles on the 22nd. You're going to want to get in on this if you're in the Southern California area because we're going to see Space Shuttle Endeavor. I'm so excited about that. We're going to go to hacker spaces. We're going to go out uh, and have some adult beverages. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it's all ages. It's everybody come on out. Um, and then on the 29th, San Diego. So just wanted to hit you real quick with those dates uh, as I track across America, the hack across America, all of those things. Um, and with all of that, we've got a fantastic show. We've got stuff from Portland. We've got stuff from Maker Fair. So stay tuned, and I'll see you guys on the road. Sure, so the latest is uh, the Public Laboratory, my uh, group and community. We just launched a new Kickstarter, uh, Infogram, which is uh, short for our infrared photogrammetry, uh, which is measured and doing quantified infrared photography. Uh, and it comes out of our balloon mapping work of trying to get the same type of imagery that um, land management agencies use for their big decision making, which is false color imagery to um, look at chlorophyll activity in plants uh, and determine um, land water boundaries and also like how plants are doing in fields. And uh, the way they do that is they have satellites with uh, multispectral cameras that capture visible and infrared light. And uh, then they are able to do a series of vegetation indexes uh, and transforms on those images. So you weren't able to do that kind of stuff with the technology you were using before with your balloon photography? Well, we were just using standard point and shoots. And uh, so we started out prototyping, uh, converting cameras to shoot infrared and flying camera pairs. And uh, then we had a breakthrough, actually, uh, Ned Horning, uh, who's a, one of our community researchers, and Chris Fasti were realizing, well, hey, we can do it in one camera using a single filter. So we take out the infrared filter that would normally prevent infrared light from going through, and then put a filter like this in that blocks uh, just the red channel. What does, it, together. what does it take to take the IR filter out of a camera? It means stripping the camera down to the CCD and uh, putting it back together again. So depending on the camera model, most of the Canons, it's pretty straightforward um, and pretty easy to get down there. You have to be careful when you're handling the CCD and you can't lose track of where the screws go. So It's not all the same screw? It's not all the same screw. So I do it by drawing the camera out on a piece of paper taking all the screws and stick and putting them down the piece of paper where they came out uh, and taking cell phone photos as I go and then reversing the process. This camera took about uh, an hour and a half mm -hmm. open to close to convert. Wow. Uh, and I'd never used that model before. Uh, that's about a normal hour and a half to two hours to do the conversion. Now the webcams are super easy because the webcams just have screw in lenses. So like this one, um, you just mark the fixed focus of the lens with a little pen or something and then just unscrew it. So there's the back of the lens and normally there's a piece of polyester filter stuck right there at the back of the lens. And you just peel and it you off? Just kick it off with your, with your thumb and then if you're really good, I, I couldn't cut a circular piece of filter well enough to stick into the body so I stick it on the outside. But Does that, it matter where you put the filter? Uh, you get slightly better results if it's inside. 
because okay. you don't get reflections on the surface of the filter. Sure. But outside works pretty well too. And uh, so then you just screw it back in and make sure you get the fixed focus back to the right point. So, yeah, webcams, I can't, yeah, I can't recommend that enough. Webcams, like, they focus to infinity, right? Right. It's such a huge uh, depth, of, depth of field. So, it's the same process with, um, with my 808 cam. The filter was actually embedded in the plastic in front of the lens. Oh, so that's, so um, the 808's the easiest to hack. So that wasn't actually, well, actually it was a little harder because instead of unscrewing the lens and taking it off the back, I had to, I took the lens and actually just sanded it down really quickly. And then I popped the piece of glass out of the front. So I don't have a screwdriver on me to show you. But yeah, it was like actually embedded in the plastic on the front. Huh. So I did ruin the visible light filter because I sanded down one <laughs> side of it. But the lens is in great condition, so it was fun. Cool. And so we end up getting... Instead of red, green, blue, we get near infrared, blue, green. What do you mean near infrared? Near infrared, so infrared's a really wide band, right? Visible light is a small band running from, you know, a little over 400 nanometers to just below 700 nanometers. So like 300 nanometers of visible light. And uh, then near infrared is another 300 nanometers worth of invisible light that runs from about 700, well, 400, so 700 to about 1100. But infrared is really wide. So what we're, so, so near infrared is very much like visible light. We just can't see it. Far infrared is what we normally think of, which is like thermal mapping, like FLIR cameras and that kind of stuff. And so what does that allow you to see? Sure, well, I'll show you some images. It lets you, so plants in infrared, if you just look at a pure infrared image, are gonna come out bright white. And that's because when plants are photosynthesizing, they can't, uh, um, chlorophyll can't effectively utilize the near-infrared band and it would cause them to overheat. So they, um, they reflect it. And so you get, so our false color images come out looking something like this. You get <clears throat> all, uh, almost a white or pale colored uh, plants. And then we're able to do, to subtract the band, the infrared from visible light bands. This is really typical, right? White plants, dark sky. Wow. Um, and so what do you, what do you gather from that because it's a white plant? Does well. Does it tell you like something about the health of the plant or something? Right. So the plants are going to be reflecting amount of infrared. If they're dead, they're not going to be reflecting infrared nearly as much. So you can actually have a green plant that's not photosynthesizing. So if you're looking at it and it's green, you're not going to get that much information about what, uh, how it's doing health-wise. So the general processing that we do is uh, NDVI. And what NDVI is, is a normalized difference vegetation indexing. So here's that same photo. This is in our alpha web app, which we're, and this is our big po point, which is Infogram's going to be a web platform for doing this type of image processing. So you get your false color image with near infrared in that channel. And then uh, this is just the near infrared channel. And then if you subtract the visible band from the infrared band, it's a little more math than that, you get it, an image where the plants just come out one color. So there you can see plants pop out in just green. And then, that and then, then you can quantify that, those values to determine uh, somewhat how the plants are doing. It's really dependent on um, it lets you correlate on the ground investigations to a bunch of plants. So if you know how a few plants are doing down in your field, you can take those spot surveys and extrapolate them out to like a whole field of plants. And so how would you use this? We'd use this, uh, so the way it's used in land management is to spot problems in fields. So Cargill and, and uh, ADM and those folks have, sat, have their own satellites monitoring cornfields in the Midwest and they'll pick up plant infestations or, I mean, uh, uh, insect infestations or other things through dark spots in their vegetation indexing imagery. The other thing that they're used for is, uh, and the case that got us into it was wetlands management, which is that they're, because wetlands uh, are very difficult to survey, the, um, the aerial imagery is a major part of our wetland manage management strategies. Why are they difficult to survey? because uh, there's a lot of mud. You gotta take out a boat just for mud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so they, they end up doing aerial surveys instead. 
and they're and the bringing the plants out in extreme relief like this into that like where the plants are popping out as just one color lets you determine um, very simply the like active land water boundary of like where like irrespective of tides because the plants are only going to grow where they're out of the water and so when if you can draw that if you can draw a firm line between where plants are and where water is you know how the land is doing, whether it's receding or advancing, uh, and whether plant growth is holding that land in place. So you're saying you can just figure out where the water table is based on what's growing? Well, more specifically, where the land is. Mm. How, are, how well are we doing holding on to land? Because those, those wetland buffers are the important thing, especially in the Gulf of Mexico or on the, on the East Coast, where they have a, a sh more sloping drop-off to their, their continental shelf. Those, those wetlands are water protecting the shore from storm events. So how well they're doing, how much land is still there is a, is a vital thing to keep track of. Wow. So, yeah. I didn't know that, that was a thing. I, mean, I just thought the Everglades were pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, the Everglades and, and all, the, um, all the swamps of the, the Gulf are the, the most useful barrier to storms that we have. So here's like... Here's a pasture up in Vermont on Gigapan. Right. So, and so this is the same stitching software they used before, but right. now using these different filters. And so what, what do you tell practically out of this image? Right, so we're looking at a, um, a forest pasture, I believe in New Hampshire. And so here you can, you have these varying shades of in invisible light, you have like varying shades of green all over. And then in just um, by doing this transform, you can pull out the trees as dark areas and the grass that are very actively photosynthesizing. And so is the idea that over time you would continue doing these surveys and then see the differences? Right. So the most, the most useful thing is in, is in uh, uh, tracking other factors and correlating to these. So if you're a home gardener, tracking like how many pounds of tomatoes do you get off of one plant versus another, and then look at their color values. And the next year you could kind of judge your yields based on the previous year's color data, those kinds of things. And those can be extrapolated to big fields. So um, Doran Cox, who I believe this is one of his pastures, is in Vermont, he's one of our community researchers. He's been using uh, some of our prototype hardware over the last years to do field trials of cover crops. And so he's got some temperature data on the ground, he's got harvest quantities because he's quantifying how much like, hay he actually pulls in from each one of these different trial sites, and he's correlating that to the imagery he gets. So. That's cool. So are you able to get temperature data from this? No. no. So. Is that next? Is that important? Uh, that would be something totally different. So hacking a camera like this or doing, uh, like, on our Kickstarter we're putting together, we have like webcams and stuff. These kinds of technologies aren't going to get you, the CCDs can't pick up the far infrared. So that stuff is like way outside of our range. You need a custom sensor for that. But we're able to do like very simple modifications and get um, functional NDVI because we can get the near infrared. And so, what light. is this right here? What is that sensor? This is this is a webcam. This is a webcam that came out of a uh, a laptop top. And this type of webcam is actually really fun to play around with because uh, normally, if you pick up a webcam that's like a um, little box webcam, external one, it only implements part of the UVC spec, which is the um, camera specification for um, for um, USB webcams. Really? And why is that? Because it's cheaper. And yeah. so when the in the in laptop cameras, they tend to implement the whole spec, which means you can set the white balance and uh, auto exposure, and you, and you can reprogram them and actually send them full instructions instead of having them like running in auto mode all the time. Um, and so that allows you to do the kind of uh, yeah, same camera energy? just pulled out the filter. And, and what is that? Uh, uh, what is that? Just little tiny. Uh, piece of gel or whatever on the end of the lens. It's the same gel I'm using here. It's a, um, what is it? So these are, these are the filters we're using. We're actually using uh, theatrical uh, deep dyed polyester filters instead of glass filters. Oh wow. Because they get similar response. 
And, and they're a lot cheaper so than scientific than glass. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so what does uh, what does the new Kickstarter involve, technology wise? So, technology wise, we've got three uh, reward levels. We've got um, my favorite, which is the ten dollar reward. I mean, obviously, I'd like more of people's money, but the ten dollar reward is my favorite because you can just convert a camera like this. So, this is a uh, power shot I picked up on Craigslist for fifty bucks because mm -hmm. it's pretty old now, and I pulled out the filter, and it, the, our uh, our Kickstarter will come with. Filter pack, and this is a white balance and target card for doing. Oh, I see. Uh, so you for, calibrate based yeah. on that blue and, and green and black. Right. So you do a white balance to the gray spot, sure. And then you check your results by looking through it and seeing, okay, so do I actually get a clean image? Do I get a clean green and a clean blue and a clean white and a clean black? What does that look like when you do it on the camera? Do you actually give a viewfinder on that? We can see. Yeah. So, I'll get a white balance. Oh, it's the memory card out. I think I can still white balance it. So, the card's color response is pretty good. Set my white balance point. So, it was already pretty well white balanced, but there you can see I'm getting blue and green. But if I point it out at anything else, at a bag, right? Mm -hmm. So, Look at that. Our vel the Velcro of that bag may look green in uh, invisible light, but it's actually reflecting a significant amount of near infrared. So we're talking about this area right here. Mm -hmm. the, on the camera, it's kind of like orange. Right. Because we're feeding near infrared into the, into the red band. Wow. So it turns out Velcro is extremely responsive in near infrared. <laughs> Did not know that. There's <laughs> <laughs> something new over there. That's fantastic. And uh, yeah. So that's our ten dollar reward level. At thirty five bucks, we're gonna have a factory modified um, set webcam that'll probably be a model very much like this. Um, and then at uh, ninety five dollar level, uh, this is the reward we're still working on. It'll depend on how well, how many backers we get, but we're gonna have at least a two megapixel camera that um, has a battery and memory card, etc., so people can walk around and aim with it. So. My prototype is an 808 cam. Nice. Um, and so this one has a, if you look really close, I, I got a little blue filter in the top. Just on barely it. see that. But um, hopefully it'll be something uh, uh, much like that. And, and so with the a card. camera this size, of course, that means your balloon would not necessarily have to be five and a half feet. Right. You could do, uh, so I brought a bunch of kites with me, but yeah, you could do it a, a six foot or even smaller kite, a five foot or four foot kite to lift one of those. And so are you uh, still a fan of the kites over the balloons? Um, whenever there's wind, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm getting to be a big fan of these 808 camps. Um, the West Lothian Archaeological Society, uh, John Wells over in Scotland, he got me into these. Uh, he has been working with kids and, I mean, the cheapest kites. They're doing aerial mapping for, like, less than 50 bucks for the whole kit, you know, which is, like, camera, rig, string, kite. And it's the kind of thing you can hand to a 10-year-old and say, let's go out and map this archaeological site. So, uh, yeah, I've been a big fan of these. But another thing I brought, and this is fun, this isn't commercial, but uh, this is from the UK again. Um, well, this one's Japanese, but learned this from the UK, guys from the UK. Uh, this is a 40-foot, this is a 40-foot uh, photo pole. So this is all carbon fiber and uh, telescopes out. And um, it's my really simple rig. I basically mount on the top and then uh, put a put a quarter twenty bolt to hold my, <laughs> put a quarter twenty bolt to hold my camera on right there. And so you just put a point and shoot on this. Yep. And now you've got a forty foot hole yeah. that you just send up into the sky. Yeah, it weighs nothing too. You can really? Man, I want those for Wi-Fi antennas. Right? Yeah. So yeah, they're sold as carp poles. They're for fishing for carp. Apparently in Japan and the, U and the UK, they have this method for fishing where uh, instead of using a reel, they just use a single long pole. And they tie a, a bait to the other end. I really don't know much about the fishing side, but um, totally awesome for photography. <laughs> and I love that use of technology. Around.
What would you say failed? Okay, so this is my Raspberry Pi, Hack Raspberry Pi cam. Uh, you can see it's here. I got the lens out and I have it mounted on. Uh, this is a filter switcher that's normally a component inside a security camera and a, sec a security camera lens. And um, the lens mount works. I can get photos. I've got a, a reduced, um, reduced angle from this lens because the sensor is kind of small in the Pi cam. But my big hope with this was that I would be able to match the Pi cam to a filter switcher and do near infrared and visible light photography in here. So I can pull the, so right in here I can actually pull with a solenoid, I can pull the visible light filter out in front of the camera. Unfortunately, the Raspberry Pi cam, the filter is not attached to the sensor. It's not attached to the lens, which is pretty normal. Normally you have it like on the inside of the lens or mm -hmm. someplace where it's easy to be removable. It's actually attached directly to the sensor. So it's essentially impossible to get out. Um, but I was, I was really hoping that was gonna work because it would be so badass to be able to do the near infrared photography on the Pi cam because it does it shoots raw and. What well, about with like the little webcam you were talking about? Right. So yeah, these webcams still work, and actually, um, uh, some folks in our community um, are working on uh, software for the Pi cam controlling the, the USB webcams. Uh, we don't shoot raw. We still have to work with JPEG imagery that comes off of there. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's what we're that's what we're doing. So, this was like yeah, I was so upset when I when the Pi cam came in the mail. Well, only, only like a day later, you know, because I got it and I spent a day setting it up and then I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs>